Well, before I begin, I would like to share with you the greetings of my wife, as well as our congregation in West Warwick. Everybody says Providence, but we really never been in Providence. <laughs> um, it's kind of a mystery. Um, I would like to clarify one thing that Jeff Brodnack says, kind of a rumor that he has spread, and that we have a, a, a the counseling business or something like that. I, I've heard him saying that several times and I tried to correct him several times. So let me, let me clarify what's going on here. We have a church. It's, it's a good place to stop, right? We have a church and the church has a ministry. And that ministry is a ministry that reaches out to people who are hurting. And sometimes we call it counseling, but it's biblical counseling, right? We use this, nothing else. And as we use that, people around the community have heard about it. They've known about it. And so they send people to us. We have a number of churches that keep referring people to us for help. And we have a ministry that reaches out quite far, actually, by the grace of God. And when God says go, we, we go. And we don't say no. I never dare to tell God you're making a mistake. <laughs> I don't think it's a good place to be. But anyway, God has blessed it. And uh, we've had, oh, I should have gotten the numbers, but we have around 2,300 sessions with people. And in, in just about all of them, we share the gospel. And I mean, we really share the gospel. So it's great. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful occasion to, to serve the community and to serve one another as well in Christ. I, I mentioned earlier um, that sometimes I feel like the Apostle Paul, when he was in prison and having people going to him to hear the gospel. I always hear every time I talk to other people, I hear people asking, how do we go out and reach out? I get, that, that's great. That's wonderful. But people come to us. <laughs> they, they line up. We have to schedule them. We have to make appointments because they line up to come to us. And I'm thinking, is this real? <laughs> anyway, it's a bliss. But brethren, one more comment that I would like to make. Uh, and please pray for our assistant pastor. He's taking over the service today. And he's come, just came back from, from visiting his family. And before he left for visiting his family in Texas, uh, we had a conversation and it almost sounded like he was getting ready to say his goodbyes. He has cancer. Um, it is an aggressive form of cancer. And he's going to be starting uh, a pretty, pretty strong treatment, very strong treatment actually in just a few days. So, that's one reason my, my wife did not join us. It's not because she doesn't like you or, or your hospitality, which, by the way, is deeply appreciated. It, it's because we felt that she needed to be there to honor our assistant pastor um, because the congregation is something really special for him today. So I would appreciate if you could share some of your prayers for him because he's really going through a very difficult time right now. The final thing, well, this week we celebrate Veterans Day. And on Veterans Day, we remember and appreciate the service and the sacrifices. So many members of the armed forces to whom goes our profound debt of gratitude, doesn't it? But in a very real way, we also appreciate and celebrate an extreme act of service and self-sacrifice, that of Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, who stands as the ultimate veteran in a way for the freedom and the protection of us all. We praise him. Well, I have a job to do, so I better get to it. 
It's not really difficult to do, but imagine going to church on Sunday. At the entrance of the church, there's a man sitting on the ground. It's pretty dirty, smelly. He has a hood on his head. And, well, as you can imagine, many people just go past him, ignoring him without even noticing him. A few just slow down enough to drop a coin, a little bit of money in front of him. One person, one, stopped enough to say, are you okay? Do you need anything? Then, of course, the time came for church to start. So everybody was inside and everything was normal. The announcements, as usual, being given by the deacon. And there was some music, some songs and hymns. And then after that, nothing. Silence and more silence. You know how it is when you have a silence for a little bit, the, the, the people start getting a little edgy and start moving on. Things has not changed. It's the same today as it was then. And I would like to share what Jesus had to say about things of this nature, because I think it's important. And besides, it's a reading for today, so one of them. It's from Mark chapter 12, and verses 38 to 44. In his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long roads and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and cheap seats in the synagogues and places of honor and banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearances' sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Then he sat down opposite to the treasury and began observing how people were putting money into the treasury and how many rich people were putting in large sums. And the poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. And calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. You heard that. But what's the context of that statement that Jesus made? Well, if you if you backtrack a little bit, you see that you find the cleansing of the temple, where Jesus addressed the worldliness that was going on around the temple and temptation of the people that had to travel and get to Jerusalem and then have to exchange the money and buy the sacrifice. And then it was followed by teachings of faith and forgiveness, which was followed by a conflict with religionists, a conflict with the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the scribes. And then the teaching about Messiah and the love of God. I think is extremely important, especially in that context. And followed by this passage with the teachings about the error or the errors of the scribes. And after he has silenced the religious leaders, Jesus spoke to the crowds about the heart. What motivates us? What moves us? What distracts us? And what really, really matters in life. So let's review it together a little slower and understand it a little better. Verse 38 again. And then, by the way, if you see that a little bit different is when reading it from a more New American Standard Bible. Verse 38. In his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes 
who like to walk around in long rooms and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces. So the scribes that he's referring to are the scribes who do these things, not as the wording, beware of the scribes who like to do these things. So not all the scribes were doing that. Not all the scribes were included in that, but those who had that particular attitude. What attitude? Well, that is what he says. Those who like to walk around in long robes. Nothing wrong with wearing a robe, nothing wrong with walking around. But these weren't just doing that. These people craved that. They liked long robes and respectful greetings. It was a form of lust for them. They needed that in order to feel important enough. Now, long robes were typical for of aristocrats and intellectuals. And usually these robes had were actually a religious attire that the people originally would, would wear in the context of the service or in, in the synagogue. But then, of course, you know how it goes. They want to be even more righteous and look more righteous, so they start wearing them in the marketplaces, in the streets, everywhere, so they, everyone can see how righteous these people are. The point is that they wanted to draw attention to their status. Look at me, the screen. How important, how pious I am. Again, nothing wrong with ropes and greetings, but they have been made a symbol of the status. Uh, today is not very different, is it? We don't go around in long ropes, perhaps, maybe some people do, but we need many times to be called in special terms. I don't know. You know maybe reverend or doctor or pastor or I don't know, maybe professor. <laughs> and I mean, woe to you if you don't address me that way, because then I'm going to let you know that you slipped. Of course, you never heard anyone doing that, have you? So let me share, because you probably never heard anyone doing that, which, uh, by the way, we're not supposed to lie. <laughs> um, let me share what happened in a pastor's meeting. It was a large pastor's meeting. Quite a few pastors were present. But you can immediately know this one thing. The pastors of the larger churches, the big churches, will gather together and pray with one another only. The pastors of the small churches, honestly, they're not important. They were not relevant. But the ones in the big churches, oh yeah, they look for each other, they gather together, they cluster together, and they pray for one another, long prayers. Sounds familiar? I think we just read about the book. It's a spirit of vanity or pride or hypocrisy that is still present even today. Verse 39, he was talking about bewaring of those who like these things, including the chief seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the banquets. Huh. Yeah? People crave the best seats. They really want to be honored by being placed in the, in the right place. The seats in, the, in, in this particular case, the chief seats in the synagogues were the, the seats next to the scrolls of the law. I mean, there was a, usually a box or a, a container where the scrolls were kept, and it was up front in a synagogue. And of course, next to that were some seats, and those were the craved seats because they were in front of everyone. And if you sat in there, that was a place of honor. They were reserved, of course, for the most important people. 
And you should see the humiliation of the people. They were told to just pass by. The places of honor at banquets. Back in those days, they usually there were the seats closest to the host because they would receive special attention in the banquet and special treatment during the meal. And of course, everybody wanted to be there. It's clearly a matter of the heart, isn't it? We're talking about people who are, because it's the same thing today, lovers of selves instead of lovers of God. When everyone wants in that frame of mind is the attention, the attention during the meetings, attention during the prayer, and, and the power struggles and to maintain that control, to maintain that influence that they think they have the, the power. Maybe it's stealing recognition from others, others who may be a little more humble, and although they deserve it, in some cases, greatly deserve it. They don't get it because they don't fight for it. Now, my wife is connected with a, with, a, with a group of pastor's wives. And she, she tells me how often the pastor's wife in the congregation is ignored. Totally, completely ignored. Like she doesn't count. And yet, they're there serving all the time. I'll tell you one thing. If you count the hours of work that I put in for the church and you count the hours my wife put for the church, I'm not so sure which one is going to win. Because she works more than full time for the church. Now, she doesn't do it for recognition. Far from her. But I think it's appropriate sometimes when someone places the heart in something to acknowledge that. Isn't it? But of course, they're not in the important seats. So why would they need to be acknowledged? Verse 40. Beware of those who like these things and who devour widows' houses and for appearance's sake offer long prayers. These will receive the greater condemnation. Now, devouring widows' houses, yeah, there's a lot of debate in terms of what that might have meant back in the days of Jesus, and people say one thing, others say another, but you know what? There is something that is very, very clear in that. These people abuse their position. They abuse their authority as religious leaders. And as they did so, they did it by exploiting the weak, by taking advantage of those who don't have a voice or don't have the strength to stand up or the power to say, no, this is wrong. And so they were feeding on them just like hyenas, forgetting all, of, all that Jesus talked about pure religion. Because remember pure religion, what that is? to serve the widows and the orphans in their afflictions. Not to put up big robes and going around like, I'm the most important person on the face of the earth. There were wolves in sheep's clothing, Jesus said. Taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of the elderly, of the weak, of the hurting, and all along, all through that, making their prayers long and wordy. Because when you pray a long prayer and a wordy prayer, and by the way, the latest fad put in those key words that you know are going to resonate with the others around you so they know that you are on board with that or the other faction or that or the other friend. Because that means you are in. You're a part of the crowd. But you know, and I know, that those are prayers that I not for God. Those are like speeches, the people around, instead of a prayer that addresses 
God Almighty, the creator and sustainer of all things. Futile. Now, what is wrong with all this is that it causes them to receive a, a greater condemnation, and that is because of the heart. The heart is not where it needs to be. They say, well, you didn't need a degree to know that. You're right. You didn't need a, don't need a degree to read this either. But I hope that as we read them, the heart changes and responds. And that heart needs to be a heart of love. Because just a little bit before, Jesus reminded the people that what is most important here is love for God and love for the neighbor. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus actually said more than that. He said, on these two words, love for God and love for the neighbor, depend or hang the entire law and the prophets. That means the entire Old Testament, which means the entirety of all scripture that was available at that time hinges around one word. And you know what that is? Love, which is then broken or divided, not broken, divided between love for God and love for the neighbor. You know, at, at one point, Jesus even said something that if you pause and think it through, it's actually impossible for us to do. Because the commandment that Jesus gave us is a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. And I say, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Pull the brakes, hold your horses. That you love one another the way that I have loved you? Lord, what are you doing? Because, wait a minute, God is love, right? Remember? Okay. And he is perfect. And his love is infinite and all encompassing. And now he's commanding me to love the way he does. But, 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 but Lord, wait a minute. I am not God. How can I, who am not God, love the way you do? It takes God to love the way God loves, doesn't it? Yeah. So what are you doing, God? Are you setting me up for failure here or something? What, what's going on? Well, you need to keep reading in the New Testament to figure it out. It does. Because Peter comes into the rescue and says that God makes us partakers of the divine nature. The very nature of God in us. And isn't that a nature of love because God is love? Paul goes even further and makes it even more clear in saying what? That the Spirit of God pours out the love of God in our hearts. By the way, Romans 5.5, if you want to reference that. Okay, pours out the love of God in our hearts. Minute, minute. Not my love, not your love, the love of God. And that's what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about that. He was talking about love, which, by the way, we need to define it because I'm not so sure that we all speak the same language when we use that word. Because love means so many different things to so many different people. Love could mean, I love this couple. <laughs> I like it. It's pretty. But that's not love. So in order to figure it out, I think we need to go to John 3.16. Everybody knows that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So do I in peace and he will not perish but have eternal life. There you go. I said it in one breath. Okay, so why do I say that? Because it is from that statement that we can draw a definition of love. For God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? Himself in the person of his son. For whose benefit? The world. So here I draw the definition of love from there because I say, well, if you look at what God did, here's what he did. Love is a giving of oneself for the benefit of a beloved in Christ. That's right there. 
and give him oneself for the benefit of the beloved in Christ. What did God do? Give himself for the benefit of the beloved, you, and I'm in Christ. And what is he asking us to do? To give of oneself, to give of ourselves for the benefit of the beloved in Christ, just as he does. And so here is the God who can say, love one another, even as I have loved you, because honestly, it's not my love. It's not your love. It's his love poured in our hearts and expressed through the word, expressed through obedience, expressed through the walking with him, so that through the, partic the participation that he calls us to, to have in him. But when you look at the world, as Jesus did at that moment, contrasting it with what he had just preached about love, and then you have, you have like a punch in the eye. You know, boom, it hits you really, really like a stark contrast, doesn't it? Because it's all the opposite. These people were caring for themselves, not for the other. It's not a giving of, of oneself for the benefit of the other in Christ, but it's a taking from others and as much as you can to make yourself better. You see the lust in there, not the love. And it's all about appearances, the looks, the impressions. Of course, as long as we look right, as long as we get right impressions, well, then who cares about the substance? Verse 41. And he sat down opposite to the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury, and, and many rich people were putting in large sums. See, Jesus is completing his lesson here as he does that. And so he sits in a place where he can see what people put in the treasury of the temple. Of course, not just him, but he's a, his disciples with him. And most people, of course, it was around the Passover, most people would make, you know, special donations, and there was a lot of money going through the treasury of the temple. But I don't know, if you, if you look at the wording in there, you can tell that Jesus and the disciples were able to tell how much people were putting in the treasury. I mean, how many of you can tell how much your, the person next to you is giving in the offerings and donations? Mm -hmm. I tell you, no one. Because by policy, we say that's private. That's confidential. When we address our counters and the treasurer, one of the things we say is, look, the wrong word about that, and you are fired. We can tolerate a lot of different things, but once you start spreading out words about how much people give or the confidential things, no, 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 that's, that's a no no. Do you realize that if Jesus and the disciples were able to tell how much? people were put in the treasury. Do you realize what that means? It means that somehow the people that were putting the money in the treasury did it in such a way that everybody would know. Does it tell you something about their heart? I used to be a member of Rotary. In fact, I was in various offices in Rotary for a while. And I, I remember, I remember conversations that we had, and you know they, they, they want to do good things for the community, and it's it's a wonderful thing, great, and, and I had a lot of respect for that, and until until it dawned on me, there was more to it than it met the eye. Yeah, they were doing good things for the community, yes, but. I noticed at first that, wait a second, everything they do needs to start and finish quickly. It's not really sustained over a long period of time. And I said, I don't know, why, why is that the case? I mean, you know, I'm curious. I'm, I'm a troublemaker, I always ask questions. And then I had conversations with several officers, and, and I discovered that just about all of them 
were doing it because they, they said it makes them feel good. Interesting, isn't it? Can you imagine serving only because it makes you feel good? Who are you serving then? Huh. Well, it made me think, and uh, some things change. Well, a poor widow, as, as Jesus was observing what these people were doing, a poor widow came and put, on, put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent, into that treasury. Two copper coins. The value of this donation was 164th of the average daily wages, which means the wages that you will earn with seven and a half minutes of work. Not an awful lot, is it? It was very little. Well, it was very little for the others, not so little for her. She was a widow, most likely oppressed, poor. It really made a difference for her. You can imagine, here you have this, this little bit of money and <clears throat> you were thinking, I can use this to buy a little bit of bread, probably keep me going for another meal. And then she, she said, here I am, coming to the presence of God. And now, he can be alive for me, but I want to give this to him. I want to share this because it will let his word go out. It will make a difference in someone's life. So then verse 40, verses 43 and 44, <clears throat> in conclusion of this passage here, a, a, a poor, I mean the poor widow did that, and Jesus, calling his disciples to him, said to them, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, because they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. Now, we live in a transactional society, brethren, and, and I really don't want to look